Ridicule is not a part of the scientific method, and the public should not be taught that it is. Dr. Joseph Allen Hynek was a scientist and astrophysicist, and he didn't believe in UFOs. That was exactly why the United States Air Force wanted Dr. Hynek to work as a scientific advisor on Project Sign, Project Grudge, and Project Blue Book, programs which studied encounters with UFOs. Dr. Hynek studied UFOs for the government for 21 years, and the United States Air Force wanted Dr. Hynek to debunk UFO cases, which he did. He gave the famous dismissive explanation of UFOs as, quote, swamp gas. Dr. Hynek later regretted this work, trying to debunk and dismiss UFOs, as he realized that the UFO phenomenon is much more than swamp gas, and is something that we do not yet understand. I was there at Blue Book, and I know the, the, the job they had. Uh, they were told not to excite the public. Uh, don't uh, rock the boat. Uh, and I saw it in my own eyes happened that whenever a case happened that they could explain, which is quite a few, they made point of that and, and let that out to the media. Things that, the, the cases that were very difficult to explain, they would jump the handsprings to keep the, the media away from them. For their, they had a job to do, uh, to, whether rightfully or wrongly, to keep the public from getting excited. Hynek later founded QFOS, Center for UFO Studies. This iceberg is based on Dr. J. Allen Hynek's system of classifying UFO sightings, the Close Encounter System. As we go deeper into the iceberg, the encounters will become more and more bizarre. Thank you for watching. At this level, misidentification is entirely possible, easily. This is also where the majority of UFO sightings fall. These distant encounters usually nocturnal lights, could be planets, stars, satellites, meteors, or regular aircrafts or drones. In short, a distant encounter is any UFO seen at a distance greater than 500 feet. The Phoenix Lights. March 13, 1997. There was a mass sighting of unidentified flying objects over Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. The craft was usually described as a V-shaped object with multiple lights along its leading edge. The governor of Arizona at the time mocked the thousands of people who witnessed the object in a press conference shortly after. Years later, the governor would admit that he too saw the object. I'm serious now. That, that it was a, it was a, unquestionably it was a UFO, which means unidentified flying object. That doesn't nothing, mean we're being visited. Well, it's nothing like anything I've ever seen. And, and you're an Air Force guy. Yeah, yeah, and a pilot. Uh, got a lot of hours flying. So uh, it was pretty breathtaking. He would state in another interview that he didn't come forward because he feared mass hysteria. There was a second event that night where nine lights hovered above Phoenix, Arizona. However, these lights are believed to just be flares dropped by the military. Under Dr. Hynek's classification, the Phoenix lights would be considered nocturnal lights, unexplained lights seen in the sky at over 500 feet away. The 2006 O'Hare Airport sighting. At 4.15 p.m. on November 7, 2006, federal authorities at the Chicago O'Hare International Airport gave 12 reports from employees who witnessed a disc-shaped UFO or flying saucer hovering over gate C-17. Pilots, mechanics, and airline management reported seeing the object. Several independent witnesses outside of the airport also saw the object. One described a disc-shaped craft hovering over the airport which was, quote, obviously not clouds. As far as I know, there are no verifiable photos of the object. According to the Chicago Tribune, quote, the disc was visible for approximately five minutes and was seen by close to a dozen United Airlines employees, ranging from pilots to supervisors, who heard chatter on the radio and raced out to view it. According to one witness, the object shot through the clouds at a high velocity, leaving a clear blue hole in the cloud layer. The hole reportedly seemed to close itself shortly afterward. Whether other phenomena is used to explain this incident as the conditions were right for a hole punch cloud. The FAA and United Airlines denied any knowledge of the incident until the Chicago Tribune filed a Freedom of Information Act request. Documentation and air traffic communications from the incident have been released.
The Calvine UFO Photo On August 4, 1990, a strange, diamond-shaped, unidentified flying object was spotted over Calvine, Scotland, by two hikers. The men managed to take six photos of the UFO. A military jet was also reportedly seen circling the craft. In total, the UFO hovered for about 10 minutes before ascending upwards at very high speeds. The photos taken by the hikers were given to the Scottish Daily Record, who then gave the photos to the Ministry of Defense. The Calvine UFO file won't be released until 2072, and there are no plans to declassify the photos. However, in 2022, one of the photos was leaked by ex-RAF officer Craig Lindsay, who hid a copy of one of the photos decades ago. It matches up precisely with the photocopy and recreation based on eyewitness testimony that we already had. The McMinnville photo. May 11th, 1950. At around 7.30 at the Trent Farm, outside of McMinnville, Oregon, Evelyn Trent was returning to her farmhouse when she noticed something unnatural. A metallic disc slowly floating through the sky. She described it as, quote, silver bright mixed with bronze. She called for her husband, Paul Trent, who grabbed their camera. Paul described the object as a round, shiny, wingless object. It was very bright, almost silvery, and there was no noise. The U.S. government-funded Condon study, which investigated UFO reports, stated this about the McMinnville incident. This is one of the few UFO reports in which all factors investigated, psychological and physical, appear to be consistent with the assertion that an extraordinary flying object, silvery, metallic, disc-shaped, tens of meters in diameter, and evidently artificial, flew within sight of two credible witnesses. Foo Fighters, a term used by Allied forces to describe UFOs seen during World War II. Most of these sightings were of glowing orbs or fireballs, usually red, orange, or green which stalked military aircraft in flight. In closer encounters, these objects were sometimes described as flying saucers or metallic spheres. On December 13, 1944, the Supreme Allied Forces issued a press release officially describing the phenomena as a new German weapon. And in the European theater of World War II, Foo Fighters were called Kraut Fireballs because they were suspected initially to be a secret Nazi weapon. Despite this, Axis forces also encountered these objects, and they have never been explained. It is in close encounters that we come to grips with the misperception hypothesis of UFO reports. A distant encounter becomes a close encounter of the first kind when a UFO is seen at less than 500 feet away. 2004 Nimitz Incident The USS Nimitz Strike Group was off the coast of California. For two weeks, the USS Princeton detected multiple unidentified flying objects in the area. It was initially thought that this was just a radar glitch, but even after recalibrating their radars, the objects remained. The objects, appearing in groups, flew too high to be any sort of bird, and were able to move slower than an aircraft at the same altitude. Witnesses state that satellites detected objects appearing at 80,000 feet above sea level that would drop down to 50 feet in seconds. To their knowledge, this was not any military or commercial craft. Two weeks later, the USS Nimitz again detected an object on radar, and pilots were dispatched to its location. The pilots, one of which being Commander David Fravor, noticed something in the sea roughly the size of a Boeing 737. As we're looking at this, her backseater says, hey, Skipper, do you? And about that got out, I said, dude, do you, do you see that thing down there? And we saw this little white tic-tac looking object, and it's just kind of moving above the whitewater area. As Dietrich circled above, Fravor went in for a closer look. So you're sort of spiraling down? Yep. The tic-tac's still pointing north-south, it goes, and just turns abruptly and starts mirroring me. So as I'm coming down, it starts coming up. So it's, it's mimicking your moves. Yeah, it was aware we were there. You want to see how close I can get? So I go like this, and it's climbing still. And when it gets right in front of me, it just disappears. Disappears? Disappears. Like gone. The object was described as smooth, white, and oval-shaped, and was compared to a tic-tac or a propane tank. It also had two angular antennae-like protrusions. This encounter lasted five minutes before the tic-tac vanished, 
Fravor stated that the object was gone within a second, and, in comparison, even a jet at Mach 3 takes 10 to 15 seconds to disappear from sight. The pilots then noticed that the large disturbance in the water had vanished, and then decided to return to the Nimitz, as they didn't have enough fuel to pursue the Tic Tac. The Tic Tac then reappeared on radar, at the exact coordinates set by the Nimitz for training. These coordinates are generated by the computers aboard the Nimitz, and then transmitted to the fighters. There is no explanation as to how the objects knew this, or why it chose to wait at this point. A second wave of fighters pursued the object, one of the pilots being Chad Underwood. His fighter was equipped with an advanced infrared camera, which captured this footage of the UFO. This video was originally leaked in 2007 on a German CGI website, and then onto the conspiracy theory forum above top secret, along with the testimony of a witness, which has now been completely vindicated. In 2017, the New York Times published this video, along with two other videos of military encounters with UFOs, which were declassified and confirmed by the Pentagon to be real videos of unidentified aerial phenomena. With so many corroborating pieces of powerful evidence, such as video, radar data, sonar data, satellite data, multiple credible witnesses, two studies have been published based on the Tic Tac encounter. One published by a large group of scientists from the Scientific Coalition of UAP Studies, and the other peer-reviewed. These studies confirm that the craft generated as much energy as multiple nuclear reactors at once and should have melted from the sheer friction from its movements alone. The object traveled at impossible speeds, displayed instant acceleration, and seemed to ignore friction, g-forces, momentum, and easily broke the sound barrier without causing a sonic boom, effectively breaking the known laws of physics. The disclosure of this information started a renaissance of the UFO topic, with the U.S. government now admitting to have continued studying UFOs after the 1940s Project Blue Book claimed to have dismissed and debunked the phenomena. <laughs> gimbal and Go Fast The Gimbal and Go Fast videos were declassified by the U.S. government in 2017, along with the Tic Tac video from 2004. The pilots also state that an entire fleet of objects has been detected. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. Like the Tic Tac, this object broke the lock of the fighters and then vanished. Cube in a sphere. In 2014 and 15, there were many U.S. Navy encounters with UFOs consistently described as a cube within a sphere. These objects were seen on a regular basis sometimes hovering motionless for hours at a time over the Atlantic Ocean. These UFOs were seen so frequently that it was common knowledge aboard the USS Princeton and was a casual topic of conversation. Among these witnesses is pilot Ryan Graves, who has come forward to explain the experiences he and others had with these objects. He is also part of the same squadron that recorded the Gimbal and Go Fast videos. Quote, these things would be out there all day. Keeping an aircraft in the air requires a significant amount of energy. With the speeds we observed, 12 hours in the air is 11 hours longer than we'd expect. He has said in interviews that he's certain the objects are out there as we speak. In late 2014, one of the Navy's pilots had a near miss with one of these unidentified flying objects, which didn't appear on radar. The UFO came within 50 feet of the craft, coming from the opposite direction. They filed a hazard report because of the UFO. The near miss with the object convinced the pilots that the objects were not part of a classified drone program. They believed that government officials would not send drones to get in the way of a known Navy training area. There are older encounters of the same type of UFO. On September 29, 1960, in Alamogordo, New Mexico, as part of a larger series of UFO sightings, multiple military pilots encountered a cube within a sphere that flashed bright lights at them. These accounts were published in local newspapers. Kenneth Arnold, June 24, 1947. American businessman and pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying his plane over Mount Rainier, interested in a $5,000 reward for locating a U.S. military plane which had crashed in the area when he witnessed a string of nine shining, unidentified flying objects. 
He described the objects as flat and disc-shaped, with one being a crescent. Judging by the speed at which the objects flew from Mount Rainier to Mount Baker, Arnold estimated that the crafts were traveling at a minimum of 1,700 miles per hour, three times faster than any aircraft at the time. Arnold reported his encounter to the U.S. Army Air Force Intelligence. He wrote out the details of his encounter and included a sketch of the objects. This is one of the first UFO sightings post-World War II that gained national coverage. This is commonly believed to be the origin of the term flying disc or flying saucer, even though Arnold himself did not use that term. Following Arnold's encounter, many people began to report seeing UFOs, leading to the United States Air Force starting Project Sign, the great-grandfather of Project Blue Book. 1952 UFO Wave, sometimes called the Summer of Saucers or the Invasion of Washington, was one of the largest recorded waves of mass UFO sightings. These encounters made national headlines as UFOs repeatedly violated secured airspaces over the Washington National Airport and even the Capitol. Pilots made visual sightings and the UFOs were detected on radar. Most of these encounters were with multicolored fireballs, similar to descriptions of Foo Fighters. However, there were also accounts of disc-shaped crafts. These sightings were so numerous that the United States Air Force was even given orders to chase these mysterious crafts and order them to land. If they refused, they were to shoot down the UFOs. The USAF scrambled pilots to chase these UFOs on several occasions, yet the strange glowing objects consistently outmaneuvered the military and proved to be much faster. The CIA Robertson panel sought to investigate these sightings, and their official explanation was that temperature inversions were giving false radar readings. The Columbia River UFO Encounter On the morning of March 17th, 1981, Sergeant Yoakum of the St. Helens, Oregon Police Department witnessed a bright light in the sky traveling upriver toward the Portland airport. The light was so bright that it lit up the river like daylight. He radioed the police department and went to the St. Helens County Courthouse to get a better look at the object. He was met there by two other officers, Ricky Cade and Tim McCartney, as well as Donald Askins, who overheard the police radio chatter. Askins also saw the object and stated that it was stationary and turning the river into daylight. The police initially described to Askins the light they saw as bobbing up and down, but Askins insisted the object was stationary. The two officers were initially seeing lights from a lighthouse through fog, but then turned south and saw the object Yoakum and Askins saw that was turning the river into daylight. Askins heard the object making a loud, eerie sound, and the officers set up a portable tape recorder eight inches away from their police radio to record the encounter and capture the sound of the UFO. Askins dangled his microphone out of the window to transmit the sound to the officers. Thank you all for watching, and thank you for over 300 subscribers.